Hello, hello, Chander. Mm, hey, Francisco. Good morning. Hello, Good how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? Very good, very good. Uh, thank you for being here with us. A pleasure, pleasure. Okay, so um, just to give you a little frame about uh, the, the the full uh, course content before uh, before we start, and we still wait for a couple of people. Um, the um, the business strategy course revolves mostly around how to strategize in disruption times. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, studied uh, extensively how disruption happens. And also we have uh, extensively worked with the 6D model on uh, specific uh, uh, exercises as well in order to be able to read the disruption to understand it. So there is some theory and there is some practice behind this as well. And uh, then we open up the topic of strategy. So we clearly cover the foundations of it. And then we are with you opening the chapter now of exponential organizations. Right. And so basically, we the idea is to, to invite you today is to um, open up the topic of growth, per se. We have studied business modeling, we're studying different types, we, we have made a few cases of uh, uh, firms that are uh, exploring, let's say, new business models for different industries. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a person from Google last week who came us and, and, and talked to us about how Google is uh, working with a lot of de developers, communities, and new startups in order to extend the reach of their uh, their value. Mm -hmm. So how they they collect feedbacks between all this bottom up approach and their personal strategy. And so she works in particular with uh, uh, generative for leveraging database, and uh, it, it was a very interesting afternoon that we had. Yeah, sounds sounds good. And so now I think we can uh, we can basically start you know um, let 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 let's start with with the, with the class if you if you agree. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh -huh. So I, I guess probably both of us are Swiss and participants as well. So let's try to be punctual, love it, time and respect those who are trying. Uh, so once again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm kind of here, and thanks again for the in in invitation, Francesco, and to OPIT uh, team as well. So as you were mentioning, I put together a few slides uh, to enable this conversation and probably a masterclass, if I could call it this way, uh, to happen. And uh, the whole idea is to make it interactive. So right now there are a few students uh, who are already there on the call. And as more people join, if they do, the whole idea would be to have it more of a conversation, not just a monologue from my side. Uh, so as um, the title goes, uh, and as Francisco, you were in introducing the whole context and the flow of the program uh, today's talk would be more around looking at a new way of uh, looking at businesses uh, how the business models could or should operate from the sole perspective i would say of uh, not just kind of being existing and saying yes i have a company whether it's a startup or a scale up or an incumbent organization but how do you kind of move beyond the thought process of uh, surviving but more so in this thriving year not just uh, so called being there and but more looking at growth and also impact part of it so that's the kind of context uh, i hope everybody is able to see my screen uh, just uh, thumbs up uh, yes. yeah okay sounds yes. good you know, so, maybe Chander, just to, just to start uh, mm -hmm. before giving you full full uh, context, maybe what what you could do is to um, anticipate also a little bit where our mutual connection come from. Where did we meet, and and what is the you know like we, at the at the core of it, we are colleagues, right? So yep. I think true, it would true, be true. interesting to to explore that while yes. you them. Certainly. And then I think uh, probably yeah. so. So very briefly about myself and then that connects the dots with Francisco, how we got to uh, know each other and how we have been collaborating. Uh, so I'm, I'm originally from India, as you could probably make out by my face and uh, name, uh, those who are there in the call, but been here in uh, Zurich, Switzerland for the last uh, 14 odd years, uh, been in the professional corporate world for almost 27 years, uh, have been running my own boutique consulting firm, Enabling Excellence, for the last uh, few years, having a footprint over here in Switzerland as well as in India, primarily working with incumbents on different topics of business transformation. 
In terms of our association, uh, myself and Francisco, it goes back a few years now, and the common denominator between us is a very strong global community of uh, senior professionals and business leaders uh, from incumbents, consulting firms, as well as startups and scale up, which is called the Open EXO. That's where the first logo, which you can see on the screen. Uh, so both myself and Francisco are certified coaches and trainers and advisors on the topic of enabling uh, organizations to think different on the lines of shifting gears from linear to exponential thinking and doing. So that's the common denominator, and we have collaborated on different topics, uh, both academically as well as professionally, on time-to-time -time basis. And once again, it's a pleasure uh, to be a part of uh, his uh, group over here today. Uh, besides my association with OpenEXO, I'm also a certified trainer and practitioner on uh, values assessment and also in terms of talent and leadership development uh, through Barrett's as well as the GC Holistics Framework. In terms of my corporate career, I've spent time largely with uh, large companies like uh, UBS and Dow Chemical and Thomson Reuters, and then uh, initial few years after corporate world war into external consulting. I'm associated deeply also with the startup and scale-up ecosystem. So I'm a coach and mentor and advisor to probably uh, two of the leading uh, global uh, incubators and accelerators. One is US-based called Founder Institute, and the other one is Swiss itself called Tenity, focusing on fintech. Uh, I'm also an angel investor, uh, so participate in Swiss ventures through Sictic and go beyond and uh, work ventures as well. So that, that's kind of uh, briefly about me. And yeah, I think the common denominator between myself and Fresca so is this whole global community of Open EXO. Uh, we'll talk about that as I, we introduce the whole concept of exponential organizations and how it brought us uh, together. Uh, so to set the ball rolling uh, beyond my introductions, uh, what I wanted to highlight very briefly is, yes, each one of you are uh, students, so you might not have seen what life was like pre-Apple and iPhones and Androids of the world. But yeah, for those of us who have got some gray hair, probably Francisco a bit and me as well, I think we have seen the life uh, 40, 50 years back, which used to look something like this. Uh, probably you might not be able to relate to it. Uh, you might have seen some pictures of things like camcorders and VCRs and cassette tapes and CDs and all. Uh, what we have now for the last 10, 15 years old is everything is in our pocket, uh, obviously, and that transformation keeps on happening. Uh, so question mark is, did we anticipate this? Uh, probably not. Uh, did we anticipate what happened in terms of uh, ChatGPT uh, launched in November 2022? And just to give a perspective, I'm sure many of you might be using it actively. Uh, but the reality is, yes, it just took five days for uh, ChatGPT to have a following or the user base of uh, 1 million. And compared to that, things like Netflix and Twitters and Facebooks of the world took probably years. So I think we are living in an era which is... Uh, quite fast moving and going back to the title, uh, Francesco, you mentioned uh, each one of the students here are fast track programs. Uh, so obviously we are not expecting you to finish your bachelor's uh, so-called in five days. Uh, obviously it'll take some time, but I think the era we are living in is we are all experiencing a kind of rapid pace of development. Yeah. So now at this stage, I think what I would like to uh, invite uh, and making it interactive is I will invite all of you to uh, open up your phones or laptops and go to the platform called slido.com. Uh, and there either you can scan the QR code, which is there on the screen, or you can put in slido.com and uh, put in the code to be 1426097. I'll stop sharing and activate uh, the poll so that each one of you who are there in the call can participate. Uh, so principally what uh, we are keen to ask you is uh, what do you think is the most significant shift happening in today's business landscape? Yeah, so I'll give a, probably a few seconds for you to think through. So we have given a few options, just curious to understand according to each one of you, which is the most critical one according to you, uh, what is shaping up today's business landscape. Uh, is everybody able to access the poll? I think you, now it's not visible anymore. So I don't know if the QR code could be maybe okay. again. Fine, I'll just share again. Sure. Let, give me a second to share again very quickly. It's just that I wanted to hide the screen so that... Uh... Thank you. Yeah, that's perfect. 
Yep. So if we can quickly scan and then navigate to the other one. Okay, so let me quickly see the responses and share that. Uh, okay, so uh, there, there are nine uh, votes we have, and I, the biggest chunk is for accelerating technologies. And the next one is new business models and another response for new ways of working. Uh, so let, let, let me uh, go back to the slides and just share uh, what I believe is happening in today's uh, world and why it would be relevant as part of your studies and as you potentially, over a period of time, venture into the business world. Uh, so the reality of what we are witnessing today is all of them. Yeah. Uh, so yes, the shifts are happening. Especially what we get to see is in terms of uh, technologies, uh, that's uh, talk of the town. And when we talk about technologies, again, going back to the open ES community, which uh, Francisco mentioned and our common denominator, we track close to uh, 15 odd disruptive technologies. Uh, we hear a lot in terms of AI, courtesy chat GPTs of the world. Uh, but obviously we know there's a lot of things happening in terms of quantum computing, uh, sensors and AR, VR, or, uh, digital twins and so on and so forth. Now, each one of these are impacting uh, their own arenas, but a lot of times arenas beyond their specific dimensions. Uh, none of you probably voted for uh, this dimension, but uh, I personally see this as the pivot uh, happening in terms of the shifting consumer persona. All of you, in fact, are the key drivers, uh, the millennials and the 20s and the 30s age group, where you're shifting uh, from offline to online, uh, but also everything which comes along and how do you want the experience to look like and how you expect businesses to be respecting and aligning themselves to the experiences which you are uh, seeking. And I would say another dimension, perhaps you might not be kind of uh, appreciative of right now, but people who are in the business world are conscious that what used to happen, what used to be the case uh, 10, 20, 30 years back in terms of the risk and the opportunities, that risk landscape is changing dramatically over the last uh, few years, both in terms of uh, sustainability and the climate risk, but the business risk, the risk which is related to cybersecurity and so on and so forth. So I think uh, these are the key things which are happening in the external landscape for businesses and business leaders in terms of technologies, the customer persona and the risk landscape. Now, what is happening as a result of that is the corporate lifespan is reducing. Yeah, so if you were to look into the lifespan for S&P organization, there's a study which has been done by Harvard and a consulting firm called Innosight. The typical lifespan for a company used to be 25, 30 years, uh, probably 50 odd years ago. Now what we are witnessing, uh, the lifespan of a typical large corporate is anything to do through now 15, 20 years. And it's kind of likely to go down uh, even more so in the years to come, uh, so-called. Uh, the other dimension probably is, talked about is probably in the context of COVID, what we witnessed shifting from so-called physical to digital, as it's called, combination of digital and physical environment. I think uh, that has led to a lot of new ways of working uh, becoming a reality. Uh, let's face it, the very fact that this class is happening on a virtual basis, that was probably not imagined uh, five, 10 years ago, uh, that who would have imagined that yes, we'll be having five, 10, 50, or 5,000 people coming together in a virtual environment and learning together and having fun together and those kind of things. So I think there's a new reality and just virtual is just one of the dimensions of new ways of working, which companies are experiencing. And all this is perhaps leading to new business models emerging. So uh, again, not many of you might have experience or you might have been in your uh, uh, kind of pampers perhaps uh, in the days of uh, Kodak and the likes of Blockbusters and others. I think what we are seeing the reality is new business models of the likes of Booking.coms and Instagrams and Ubers of the world, which were non-existent uh, 5, 10, 20 years back. So I think what we are witnessing is uh, disruptive changes happening, uh, but also it's leading to what I and Francisco and a few other colleagues uh, call it abundance of opportunities. So going back to the 60 framework uh, Francisco introduced, which you are learning about, I think what what we are witnessing is disruptive era, but also disruptive opportunities emerging. Yeah, And that's where I think the focus for all of us uh, is and has been and should be that how do we leverage uh, these disruptive opportunities, not just from a risk and a threat perspective, but more so from an opportunity perspective. Yeah. 
Now, in the midst of all this, going back to what Francisco mentioned, is the whole concept of business model canvas. Uh, so another Swiss colleague of all of us, Alex Alexander, uh, brought in this whole concept of business model canvas uh, probably 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so just clarification, Francisco, you as a uh, core uh, uh, teacher, I'm assuming the students would have gone through the business model canvas. Yes, yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely, yeah. so, extensively, so, extensively. Extensively. So I'll probably uh, use a slightly modified uh, L, uh, approach to business model canvas. So typically, if you might remember, we have nine elements, uh, but uh, over the years I have started looking into it uh, slightly differently and kind of spend some time with Alex as well on brainstorming these elements. So I look into business model canvas from three dimensions, I would call it. Uh, first one is a front end, uh, which is in terms of customer segments, that who are our customers and what do you want to uh, address? And then obviously to address those customers, uh, we have product and service portfolio companies might be creating. And the second element obviously is in terms of how do you deliver uh, those uh, product and services and what is the performance they're having. Now, to enable this uh, customer segments and the marriage between customers and what the company is offering, obviously you need to engage with the customers. You need to build a brand. Uh, you need to have channels of reaching out, whether it's online or offline. And obviously you need to engage with those channels to enable what I call it in the front end is to have desirability being created, yeah? So what is the pull you're having? Uh, how you're attracting customers and how you're ensuring that they're sticking with you. So that's the front end part of it. At the back end of the business, what I call it is your enabling uh, elements, uh, which are in terms of your inputs and resources, uh, how exactly you're making your product and services, uh, your infrastructure and supply chain, whether it's in the context of a, a physical product business or a services business. And obviously, you need to be having processes and systems which are enabling you to uh, kind of create and deliver those product and services which the customers are asking for or you're aspiring them to ask for. And to enable all this to happen, obviously the core uh, is uh, talent. Uh, so for what kind of people you're having and how you're engaging with them. And at the same time, you need to be having dependency on external partners. Uh, so what, what input and resource you're getting, uh, how you're getting those from external suppliers and partners and how you're engaging with them. So that backend is what is critical for success is what I call the feasibility part of it. Yeah. So to marry the desirability from the front end, you need to be ensuring that you're putting in these building blocks, the blue uh, building blocks in the back end in place to make the business uh, feasible itself. Yeah. Now, once you have the desirability and the feasibility, uh, what becomes relevant is obviously the revenue streams and the cost structure. Yeah. And obviously, every business's aspiration, whether you're a startup or a scale-up or a large income organization, is to make profit. Yeah. End of the day, you like to have not just cost, but make uh, revenues. And those revenues should be logically greater than uh, cost, unless until probably you're financed by some uh, fund, uh, which is willing to keep on pumping in money without uh, actually making profits. So what we say is, okay, fine. Obviously, the business has to be viable to be successful in the mid to long term. Yeah, so that's a core building block is desirability from a customer perspective, feasibility from the backend perspective, and viability from a financial structure perspective. Now, all these three go hand in hand. And if all the three are on good grounds, that's where the value creation happens. Yeah, so if I have only desirability, but no feasibility and no viability, and obviously it's not a sustainable business. If I have feasible business, but no desirability, again, it's not sustainable. And if I have desirability and feasibility, but no viability, again, I can't create value on a sustainable basis. So I think these are the three critical building blocks. I see every business needs to be having to have desirability, to have the feasibility and to have the viability to be able to create value on a sustainable basis for the consumers, uh, for the suppliers, for the talent, and obviously for the shareholders part. Yeah. Now, at uh, this stage, what I would say is, obviously, uh, the whole concept of business is not new. Uh, we have been having corporations exist for thousands and thousands of years. What has started happening, I would say, in the last uh, 20, 30, 50 years, is the value creation approach has gone through a radical shift. Yeah. So what I and colleagues like Francisco say is the 19th and the 20th century belong to what we say is product inventors. Yeah. Uh, the likes of Fords and others who created Model Ds and say, hey guys, buy the Model T and I'll create value. What we are saying is in this new uh, century, uh, 21st century, 
the value creation is happening by uh, businesses and individuals who are business model inventors yeah and who are not just focusing in, in terms of what do i offer is product and services but how do i go into the front end and the back end to re-engineer and imagine new ways of having new customers new customer experiences but also in the back end how do i have new talent and new product and services new supply chain new infrastructure new processes and new systems to make it sustainable on an ongoing basis yeah so therefore innovation need not be happening only at the product and service level innovation uh, needs to be happening at the whole business model level and that's so also on a continuous basis yeah so that, that that's i would say is a key element what we are seeing as becoming a success imperative in today's uh, business uh, world part of it uh, now to enable all this to happen what we say is yes uh, this new era requires a new business model altogether uh, but before i introduce this whole concept which francisco mentioned about exponential organizations i like to do a small pause uh, perhaps invite any questions uh, francisco from you on the whole concept of business model innovation and business model invention and also potentially from the participants so feel free to use a chat function or your audio you can unmute yourself and probably share your perspectives and questions you might be having yes thank you thank you chander there is a, also a function to send uh, questions privately if you want and i can read them out if you don't want to if you're in, if you don't want to speak out uh, it, it it's okay to do that this way um and and chander i maybe i, I would like to share, to have a question i have a question for you um Something that I find quite interesting in is in the revision of your of the business model canvas, where you basically grow the the reach of the tool because you you talk about uh, met, matching together the three principles of innovation: basically feasibility, desirability, and uh, tech, and and uh, viability. Right. So, in your based on your experience as a management consultant, um, what is the Talking about today's disruption times, what is the most common need from corporations in 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 looking for uh, recommendations? Where would, do they do they need more, or where do they normally approach you? Said we all assume that the model is absolutely holistic. So when you touch a part of it, then you need to look into the whole. But it is oftentimes that. That people are looking for a solution in one of the of those three parts. So where, what is your experience in this? Mm, so I would say, uh, fortunately, have the privilege and uh, the luxury of uh, supporting and enabling businesses, both startups and scale ups and incumbents, across all the three pillars uh, in isolation or typically in combinations, uh, Francisco. So. Uh, my take is uh, the whole business model uh, strength is a multiplier effect of all the subcomponents. So if any of the elements is a weak link, uh, the overall uh, business model uh, strength is weak. Yeah, so I might be very good on the desirability part of it, but my if my front end is very strong, but my back end is shallow, I'm not going to be able to create value. Yeah, if my front end is strong and back end is strong, but I don't have viable business, then again I'm going to be in uh, trouble sooner or later. Yeah, so I would say they all go hand in hand, and that's where when I work with business leaders and including uh, businesses which are starting from ground zero, the startups. I typically share that you can't focus on only one element. You have to focus on all the three dimensions on an ongoing basis. You could prioritize and say, this is going to be a priority for this month or this quarter. Uh, the front end is going to be a focus area for me for this year, but it's not that I can ignore the back end. Yeah, I can't ignore my revenues and the cost structures part of it. I need to be ensuring viability on a day in, day out, month in, month out basis to ensure that, okay, fine, yes, I am not having leakages in the business, which is saying, yes, I'm making revenues, but I'm not making profits. Yeah, So I would say all the three elements are critical, uh, but yes, uh, businesses and the business leaders do say, yes, I want to prioritize on one of the elements on a specific period of time. And that's where I think colleagues like us enable and support them. But principally, my message is you need to focus on all the three elements on a continuous basis. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. That, 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 that's quite interesting. Um, let me see any, any question guys, uh, Fulvio, Andrea, uh, Alona, I see some few people, please don't hesitate to, to move ahead. 
maybe Chandra. Meanwhile, I also have a second question. Um, you know that I that I have a passion for the, um, the concept that the innovation is now coming for on the on the business model side rather than on products. However, when we look into the new technologies or deep technologies, mm -hmm. we see a lot of innovation coming from the technology. So again, we're talking about inventors. And so how do you see this? Mm, so again, uh, I'll go back to the whole, uh, and I don't want to share the slides and occupy the screen. Uh, see, again, I would say, two elements to it, Francesco. So technology could be a beginning point, which is enabling you to create a groundbreaking product and a service. So let's talk about GPT, uh, for example, the talk of the town for the last uh, three odd years. So what we are witnessing in the last uh, three odd years since the launch of GPT is every business is wanting to use it as an enabler uh, to enable better customer experience. I might be creating chatbots and so on and so forth. I might be creating new businesses altogether which are based on chat GPT or some other uh, AI model. What we are seeing is, yes, to uh, start the business, I need technology, yeah, which is, again, product uh, invention. Yeah. To sustain it and make uh, money, I need to create the whole engine. Yeah, So it's like, uh, I would say, Tesla, if I would use the example. It's not just good to have an EV, uh, so-called, and a software or a battery. I need to be ensuring that on a sustainable basis, I don't just have the battery. I just don't have the software. I have a channel to deliver the car to the customers. I need to be having ways of engaging uh, how do I ensure I stay in touch with the people who are buying my car and they're not having a negative experience? How do I ensure that I'm upgrading my software on an ongoing basis, either with the talent which is in-house to me or external resources, which might be tapping into? So I would say, yes, the beginning point of your business uh, and the core of your business model could be based on technology. But for the business to be successful over a period of time, you need to be building in the building blocks across this technology. Yeah, on its own, it can't survive. It's like a one-legged chair. I need to be having four legs in the chair. Yeah, uh, so called. So all of them are critical uh, if I want to have a balanced growth over a period of time. Yeah, so that that's my key take. Technology alone will not enable you to succeed in the business in the mid to long term part of it. And I'll talk about that when we talk about the whole framework of exponential organization a bit later on. Uh Thank you. Okay, that 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 is that is one of the hottest topic to me nowadays. Uh, studying deep tech, it's 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 really, it's really something we we need to. I I believe with slower we need to to create a new literature about about this. Even it, it, it's very exciting. So there, there is a question here from Alona. I'm going to read it loud for you. Huh? Desirability, feasibility, and viability. How to break down a coding school for kids, online school versus offline school model. Hmm. And then she also completes by saying, I currently teach on Zoom. I wanted to open a school. I need faster return if I start a school. Okay, so, so the, the, this question could uh, deserve or should deserve a proper conversation, but uh, at, at a very high level. Uh, Luna, my response would be yes, uh, you're looking at two discrete uh, business models. Your product and service could be common denominator. What do you teach? But who do you teach it to and how do you teach are very different things. I'll also introduce uh, another element which we'll talk about in the next uh, section of this conversation is the why. Uh, and that's the principal success factor which we will talk about in the whole uh, framework of exponential organizations is uh, what I would say is you need to look into is why you're doing what you're doing and who are you serving again the customer segments they could be very different for the online channels and the offline channels but again use the business model canvas for these two mutually exclusives but yet overlapping and similar elements to see to it uh, what is that needs to be different uh, in across different elements of the business model canvas for these two businesses if they were to be treated on a standalone basis to be successful on a short to mid to long term yeah. Uh, so, for example, in the Zoom business, so you don't need to have a physical infrastructure. Yeah, you don't need to have a physical building. You don't need to have a staff to manage that building. You don't need to have a maintenance activity, whether the building is looking good or not. What is the location of the building, whether that's in the prime area or that's, that's in the suburb. Uh, so all those things don't make a difference at all. The moment you shift to an offline physical 
uh, school activity, it makes a lot of difference, yeah? In terms of what is the location of your school, how good is it, how many chairs are there, uh, how many students you're expecting to get, uh, are the supplies going to be limited, and so on and so forth. So I would say, yes, it needs uh, some thinking to see to it what kind of business model you need to be having, what kind of resources you need to be having to enable that business to be feasible uh, across the offline and the online channels. And again, I would say at the bottom, as we talked about the feasibility is going to be quite different for the online and the offline businesses. Yeah. So think from the business model canvas dimension to see to it, okay, fine, what are the building blocks and what are relevant and not relevant in both of these elements. Yeah. So apologies, I can't answer too much in detail uh, given the paucity of time, but I would say on the nutshell, these are some of the elements you need to be conscious of. Not an easy question, though, Alona. I mean, it's, it's a one, it's a one billion so question, much. huh? Uh, it's a one billion dollar question, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you're looking for teaching coding school for kids, I mean, you have um, four or five million um, potential customers to to serve. So it's a great great business to look for. Okay, um, my dear, I think we can we can move. Okay, yeah. sounds good. And then uh, feel free to uh, share the questions, whatever we are able to address, uh, we will talk about then. And if there's anything else which is coming to your mind, uh, which you would like to get answers to, uh, feel free to chat. And then uh, maybe myself and Francisco can come back to you. Okay, so let me uh, kind of uh, shift gears to a next topic or element, if I could uh, call it this way. So we talked about uh, the innovation needs to be happening in the business model uh, dimension. How do you structure your business in terms of uh, the front end, the back end, and the, 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 the overall part of it? What I would say is uh, there's an, another element uh, which we would like to share with you starting today is a whole concept of how do you operate the business, yeah? How do you make it successful? Uh, so uh, around 10 years back, uh, both of us have been inspired by a colleague, a uh, US based called Serena Spile, who uh, kind of invented this whole concept of uh, exponential organization. So it is not our creativity uh, from the title perspective, but uh, Salim Smile and a couple of other colleagues came together in 2013 onwards to uh, frame this uh, element called exponential organizations. What uh, they said or kind of deciphered out is uh, a lot of success in businesses in the new decade of the 21st century were uh, having some common denominator and common practices or ethos and pathos, as I call them. And then uh, over the period of uh, last 10 years, uh, Salim and a lot of us who have joined and uh, been evangelizing this whole concept of exponential organization. So last year, actually, uh, a few of us came together and uh, we co-created or uh, co-created uh, the next uh, version of the book, uh, where both myself and Francisco have been contributing authors in different shape and form. So it's called the Exponential Organizations 2.0. Uh, so perhaps as a part of uh, your, your studies, uh, I would say, uh, at least I, and I'm sure Francesco will also encourage uh, you to either buy a Kindle edition or a physical copy of the book, or uh, all of us uh, would like to invite you to uh, actually access the book by joining actually the community itself, where you have to pay a monthly membership or annual membership uh, to become part of the community, which is also giving you access to the digital version of the book uh, to read more in detail. But in principle, uh, what the whole framework of exponential organization is uh, founded and centered around is that uh, organizations which have been successful and are going to be, I would use the word going to be, not the word likely to be, uh, because we are pretty convinced with the whole framework and we say this is a, a framework which is going to last uh, for a few years and few decades as a foundation of business successes, whether it's a startup or a scale-up or incumbent organization. So Salim and company talked about uh, that for organization to be successful, there are 11 core elements of uh, success. Uh, the first one being the why, as I mentioned a few uh, minutes ago, is why do you exist as a business firm itself? And they came out with a term called massive transformative purpose. Yeah. Uh, so typically in the business world, uh, we use a whole uh, concept of purpose or vision or mission. What Salim and company talked about is for organizations which are, are successful, have been successful and are going to be successful, the key differentiator is going to be something else which is going to be, they will have a purpose but more so a massive one and a transformative one. Yeah, How are you going to make a difference to uh, not just one set of stakeholders but for all the stakeholders on a sustainable basis. Along with that, uh, the 
massive transformative purpose, they decoded uh, another additional 10 attributes. Uh, the first dimension was uh, called acronym of uh, scale, which you're seeing over here. And I'll talk about uh, them uh, slightly uh, uh, in the next slide. And the next set of attributes were called ideas. Yeah, so the combination of these 11 attributes, the MTP and the scale and the ideas, uh, what we say are the key success imperatives for businesses to be successful. And uh, we will probably talk about that at a bird's eye 30,000 feet level in today's uh, session, what both I and uh, Francesco, uh, we love to invite you to again access the book, again, Kindle edition or the print copy or join the community uh, by first point being obviously accessing the book, but uh, a lot of other rich insights you can get uh, by being part of the community. Yeah. So what are these uh, exponential attributes? So purpose, as I mentioned, is a core one. Uh, the second dimension is uh, the call the scale. Uh, now, these are the set of attributes uh, which are enabling businesses, again, whether you're a startup or a scale up or an incumbent organization is what I say is enabling you to access the opportunities which are available. So going back a few slides back, I mentioned that we are living in a, a disruptive era, but at the same time, those technologies and the new customer persona, the changing risk landscape is also offering new opportunities to the businesses, yeah? So what the businesses are doing or could or should be doing, what I say is uh, leveraging these uh, five attributes of scale to enable access those different opportunities. And I'll uh, skim through uh, each of these five and the next five very quickly. Uh, so it's going to be whistle stop tour, as I call it. Uh, don't get perturbed by, okay, that was too fast. Uh, so again, the whole idea is to put the seeds in today's uh, small session in the master class. Uh, when we work with corporates, we spend half a day to two day to talk about these exponential attributes. We are going to talk about them for the next five to 10 minutes. But yes, I would invite you to go read more about them either online uh, through the book or other cases. So the very first one, what we talk about is called the staff on demand. If I go back to the business model canvas, we talked about on the back end, the talent. Uh, so in the old era of 20, 30, 50, 100 years back, the whole notion of organizations used to be, I need to hire employees and I need to have them, I need to engage with them and I need to have them on a full-time basis so that they are part of my organization. And I need to be having them stay with me five, 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah? So Toyota, for example, the Japanese organization used to be a benchmark and a role model of people staying with them for the whole lifetime. They will start with Toyota and they will retire with Toyota. Yeah, So that used to be the bedrock of corporate success from a talent perspective. Now, what we say is, okay, fine. Yes, that model was good and it's still good, but we need to have a different approach, which is to say, okay, fine. I need not be having talent, which is only internal by owning employees. I need to be tapping on to the talent which is available outside my core organization. Yeah, So for that, the term which is used is staff on demand. Yeah, where we say is the talent and the resources and human capital is not just internal to the organization, but also outside your core organization part of it. So that what you're enabling is you're leveraging the talent and the brain, which is not just limited to your 50, 100 or 5,000 or 50,000 people, but the whole world, which might be able to value add and create value for you as an organization. The second key attribute we talk about is having a community and crowd. Now, what that means is stakeholders. So when we use the word community is not around social service, uh, which is sometimes misunderstanding. What we say is the stakeholders who are with you and for you, whether it's the customers or the suppliers or the employees or investors and more so the broader public and the broader society, what are you doing to attract and engage and leverage these stakeholders in terms of creating value for your organization, in terms of creativity, innovation, and even funding? Yeah. So this whole concept of looking at the stakeholders from a linear perspective that to say, okay, fine, I need to work with my investors to create shareholder value. I need to work with customers to create customer value is old paradigms. What we are saying is look into these customers on a holistic basis to see to it, not just what you're doing for them, but what they are doing for you. Yeah. So I think that's a paradigm shift. What we are seeing is enabling organizations to be successful. And that's the second mantra of success. What we say is going to be uh, critical for organizations in the future to be successful. 
The third one is around algorithms. So again, going back to technologies, uh, what Francesco you asked for is yes, uh, this is the core, but I would say in the whole concept of exponential organizations is one of the 11 attributes of uh, successes. Yeah, so it's not the core, but one of the 11 attributes. So what we say is what enables organization to be successful is how do you leverage data and artificial intelligence? And I will extend it. How do you different, leverage different disruptive technologies to uncover different needs and satisfies those needs in terms of product and services, but also improving and reimagining your backend, the processes and the systems and your suppliers and the stuff. Yeah. So I would say that's a third element. And again, uh, we are doing a whistle stop tour. Uh, don't uh, get uh, concerned that yes, that's too fast and too over. The next one is in terms of leverage assets. So again, the old paradigm of business organizations used to be, I need to have my own uh, uh, infrastructure. I need to have my own supply chain. I need to have my own factory. I need to be having my own offices. I need to be having my own buildings. Yeah. Now, what we are saying is that was old school. What we are saying is nowadays for companies to be successful, you can access uh, just like talent, you can access uh, the assets also on uh, the, the, the centralized basis. So I need not be investing millions and millions to create my own infrastructure, but I can outsource that from somebody else. Yeah. So I would say the shared economy is the principle we talk about. So uh, having on infrastructure, having your own manufacturing capacity is not something which is a requirement anymore. What we say is yes, you can tap into somebody else's capacity. Uh, the most classical example I use over here is Apple. Uh, predominantly, I would imagine all of you might be Apple users, so maybe some might be Android as well. But Apple is a classical example. Apple doesn't manufacture his own iPhone. Yeah, I'm not too sure how many of you are aware of that. Apple's manufacturing is outsourced to their strategic uh, partner called Foxconn, which is a Taiwanese uh, uh, company, uh, which is purely manufacturing uh, um, iPhone globally for Apple. Yeah, so Apple is focusing on branding, uh, channel engagement, customer engagement, and new product innovation. There is a whole manufacturing and the supply chain part of it is being done by Foxconn. Yeah, so that's the most classic example we say is how do you leverage assets of others instead of building your own assets. Last but not the least, in terms of uh, accessing opportunities, what we say is engagement where you leverage gamification, incentive prizes, and reputation systems to create net for effect. So I think a classical example is, okay, fine, yes, you might be uh, having a product and services, but uh, which is in terms of say airlines, but all of you are part of credit cards and airline industries. So how do you kind of get incentivized to become a loyal member of that particular institution? Yeah. So if you're using credit cards, you get reward points. If you're having a frequent flyer card, you get mileage points. So how do you kind of build up that approach, not just again from a customer perspective, but again, internally and externally from different stakeholder perspective. So what uh, we say is the exponential organization leverage these five critical attributes to access and create opportunities which are going to enable them to grow fast. Yeah? But at the same time, I would say this is what you could call it is a front end. Yeah? At the same time, I need to be strong in the back end. And for that, what we say is the next set of five attributes which are enabling you to manage those opportunities become success imperatives. The very first one over there is what we call is, is interfaces. Yeah, so what technology and the non-technology capabilities you're building in, which are enabling you to access these external opportunities and especially being offered by external entities, whether they are suppliers and partners or staff on demand or your outsource partners in terms of the British assets. So what processes and systems I need to be having inside the organization to enable seamless integration of those inputs and resources coming from the outside world to enable that, yes, I'm able to create value yeah, in the long term on a sustainable basis. So what we say is these are the interfaces which enable you to connect to the outside world yeah, to access those opportunities. The second one is uh, called dashboards. So what we say is, is, yes, whether as a startup or a scale up or as an incumbent, you might be running a $1 million organization or a $1 billion or a $1 trillion organization. What is critical for you as a business leader is to have a pulse on the business, whether you are doing good or bad or ugly. And to enable that to happen, you need to be having dashboards in place, business matrices in place, 
and more so short feedback loops on the business performance. Yeah, Not just in terms of what happened one month back or one year back, but what is happening today and what is likely to happen in the future. Yeah, You need to be having those predictive capabilities to identify what could be happening in the future, which is going to enable you to be having a pulse of the business and take decisions on a real time basis yeah to ensure that yes uh, your business is going to be successful not just in the past and the present but also in the future so the whole concept of having business matrices and how do you run the business around those matrices is critical to success the next one is going back to innovation whole concept uh, that for businesses to be successful you need to be innovative but the whole difference what we say is again going back to business model innovation versus product and service innovation is you need not be innovative on a one-time basis that yes i got the next eureka i've got the gpt now and yes gpt is going to be wonderful what we are witnessing again if i go back to gpt as example is gpt 3.0 uh, was a launch, then you had 3.5, then you had 3.5 turbo, then we had four. And now, if you know it, uh, you have the latest version around a month back. And then now the new API, which got released, I think two days back, is having differentiation between the two different GPT versions. Yeah. So what we are saying is organizations who are going to be successful, they are not going to be innovating, but they're going to be innovating on a continuous basis. And the key element of that is called experimentation. Yeah. So how am I innovating on a continuous basis? but not just innovating, but how am I experimenting with not just product and services, but the whole business model on a continuous basis. Yeah, so that's a critical success factor. The next one, what we say is for all this to happen is I need to be having a different way of how do I manage my talent. Yeah, uh, again, you uh, were not born, but if I and Francisco go back to when we started our corporate careers, uh, we were used to uh, working in organizations which were large or small, which were driven by top and down command and control mechanisms, yeah, which used to be like business leaders, the top management were to decide what is the strategy, how this organization is going to work, the decisions used to be taken at the top, and then used to be cascaded at the bottom at the front line. What we are seeing is organizations which have been successful in the last two decades and are going to be successful in the future are going to have a different paradigm, different ways of working, which is going to be characterized by what we call as autonomy. It's going to be self-organizing teams. It's going to be multidisciplinary and cross-functional teams, which are able to take decisions and actions on a spontaneous basis and are empowered and enabled and having the resources to say, okay, fine, what is the best for the businesses? Yeah. So that is the key differentiator of what we visualize is going to be happening in the future. And the last but not the least, I would say is, Obviously, for businesses to work, you need to be having interfaces, as I talked at the beginning, which are going to enable you to tap onto what's happening outside from a technology perspective and the process perspective. But at the same time, I need to be able to have technology and the processes in place, which are enabling people to collaborate in-house and also with the external ecosystem, the staff and demand and the talent, which is there outside. So the last attribute of managing opportunities is what is called the social tech, is how you're leveraging different collaboration tools like Zoom and Discord and notions and the others to enable real time conversations and also enabling connections to happen both within and outside the organization, which are enabling you to move fast track yeah, and take decisions on a continuous basis. So these 10 attributes along with the massive transformative purpose is what we say are key to success in today's business era. Uh, and then I would say I will pause over here for a moment and stop uh, sharing. Uh, I'm slightly conscious of time. We're already 53 minutes. So I'll probably invite uh, quick questions, uh, Francesca, from you uh, on this whole concept of exponential organization and the 11 critical attributes and from the students as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chandra. This is paramount for our course. Uh, you are anticipating mm -hmm. something that they will study in depth also with a lot of examples in the following weeks. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> a question that I have is also a little bit anticipating the research. So I am uh, asking you something related to the, to, the, to the model that you presented based on your experience on the research that you have conducted. Mm -hmm. This model is has been created backward looking to fast growing companies and companies that have reached specific dimensions, so, so unicorns. And so we assume that the model of exponential attributes when implemented 
allows you to achieve unicorn size or unicorn speed of growth. So is it the case also for traditional companies? This is um, my, the, my question is based on your evidence, on the evidence you've collected. Mm -hmm. Is it the case for uh, public companies that are um, living with the necessities of delivering quarterly results? So can a, 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 a traditional incumbent mm -hmm. plan to respond to this? With the same logic of a startup, or what have you? What have you really? Sure. Your... sure. So, 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 can, can your question is a segue to the next section. Or I mean, it, a few it's, slides? It, it's, it's about this because it's about the attributes, right? So, which sure. attributes sure, are sure, more sure. than others? But it's a bit, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So, so it's kind of a segue into the next uh, section of uh, slides, which I'm going to be talking about. But uh, can kind of let me do a precursor uh, to that. Uh, so, Francisco, very briefly, I talked about my introduction and becoming part of the community. So, I got introduced this model probably around 2017, 2018 of the exponential organizations. And as I mentioned, the book was written in 2014. So, one of the fundamental questions I and along with other a few other business leaders have had was yes, empirically, academically, this sounds uh, like a good uh, framework and good foundation framework for success. Uh, my question has been or was uh, that can we prove it? Uh, that yes, whether in an organization which is uh, following these exponential uh, thinking and doing and the exponential philosophies and these 11 attributes, are they going to be successful and are they successful or not? So as a part of that, basically, I and along with a few other colleagues undertook uh, two research studies. So kind of going back to your question, is this model relevant for incumbents uh, as much as is there for startups and scale-ups? So I'd like to share is uh, the insights and the findings from those two studies. Uh, so just to bring in perspectives, uh, I looked into two set of organizations uh, which were looked into as part of the initial book writing of 2014. One was a study done for the US-based Fortune 100 firms. Uh, so some of you or all of you might be familiar that Fortune magazines on an annual basis Basis publishes a ranking of the top 500 firms in US and across different parts of the world, and then a global listing of the which are the best uh, top 500 firms. Yeah. So as a part of the book writing, Salim and a few other colleagues had uh, looked into the Fortune 100 firms of 2014 and ranked them on uh, their exponential scores. So they looked into those uh, 100 companies and looked into them from the lenses of those exponential attributes and ranked them. At the same time, uh, Salim and company also went around the world and looked into the Ubers and the Flipkarts and the Duolingos of the world, which are well-known names now, but probably non-existing entities at that point of time to say, hey guys, these are some of the companies we have identified who are doing something very interesting. And they were categorized as exponential organizations and looked into from the perspective of those 11 attributes. So uh, very quickly, I would like to share the insights and the findings, uh, Francisco, uh, from those two studies uh, which were done. And I'll start with the Fortune 100 uh, firms uh, to respond to your questions. Yeah. So if you allow me, and then as I mentioned earlier, uh, if there's any additional question, feel free to ping it on the chat. Yeah. So uh, as a part of the Fortune 100 uh, analysis, uh, what uh, we did, uh, Salim and myself, uh, two years back, is we looked back at these Fortune 100 firms. As I mentioned, uh, they were the top 100 companies by the size, but we had looked into them from the perspective of their exponential characteristics. And from those perspectives, we had kind of ranked these top 10 uh, companies. So the likes of Alphabet, Google, Amazon, Apple, Verizon. So these are your US names. You must be familiar with some of them, if not all. All of them and at the same time we had also identified the companies which were the least exponential uh, so the bottom 10 as we call it a lot of them were coming from the old sectors of energy and petroleum and so on and so forth but also they included some other sectors like finance and healthcare and so on and so forth uh, so what we said was these companies were the ones which were least exponential when it comes to those 11 attributes they were least purpose driven they were least scalable and they were least adaptable yeah. And there, there's, these top 10 were the most scalable and adaptable companies. So the question we were trying to get answers to was, so what? What happened with these uh, companies over a period of time? 
Yeah, so uh, keep in mind these companies were identified as a part of the book writing in 2014 as the most exponential organization and these exponential organizations. And how they were described was obviously in the reference of those 11 exponential attributes and each one of these companies was scored in 2014 by the team of Selim and other researchers. And uh, the sum total of these companies was a kind of a pen picture like this, a scatter diagram where the top 10 companies had the obviously the highest scores uh, one would expect that across different attributes but what we saw was there was a quantum difference between these different organizations uh, as you can see through both the radar chart but also through the bar chart is uh, the top 10 and the bottom 10 were differentiated by almost a factor of 2x yeah when it comes to their exponential scores so the most exponential organizations were expected to be most purpose driven twice as much as the least exponential organizations yeah uh, the most exponential organizations were expected or were rated to be almost 2x more scalable uh, than the least exponential organizations and they were expected they were rated to be 2x more adaptable compared to the least exponential organizations yeah so the question mark was so what did it make a difference uh, in terms of their performance so uh, what we said was what has been happening with these uh, top 10 organizations. Uh, so what we uh, kind of noticed through a study of eight years uh, between 2014 and 2022 was uh, two factors. These top 10 organizations and a few others who survived and thrived, and when I say thrived, means they outperformed their peer group. Uh, they had few common characteristics. Yeah, They sustained and in fact, enhance their exponential advantages vis-a-vis -vis those 11 exponential attributes. They stayed to be purpose-driven and they became purpose-enabled. Yeah, So massive transformative purpose as we talked about it. They invested in dual transformation, uh, so-called. That's a term not coined by me, but a few other colleagues. Uh, what we say is for an organization to be successful, you need to be able to exploit your backend. We talked about the business model canvas, but at the same time, you need to be exploring in the front end part of it. You need to be innovating constantly, both in terms of your processes and systems. You need to be exploring constantly and innovating in terms of your product and services in the overall business model. So are you exploiting what you have right now? And are you exploring at the edges in terms of what next for your organization? And the last but not the least, uh, the common characteristics for these organizations which are successful over a period of time was that leadership played a critical role in terms of their transformation. Uh, so what I call is they're leading from the front, not just for the sake of the name of business leaders, but actually they led from the front. One classical example I can think of and I like to quote is Satan Dela of Microsoft. Uh, we know Bill Gates as a founder, but I would say the critical success of Microsoft, which has happened in the last decade, is phenomenal. Uh, in fact, if you like, I would invite you to read the book Refresh by Satya, uh, which was written a few years back. And then, yes, you look into what is happening in the last few years, is Microsoft is probably the most biggest value creating organization in the world, Yeah, uh, along with NVIDIA now, courtesy chips and all that. So that, that's one key common characteristics. The second uh, key characteristics what we witnessed for the companies who thrived and were successful in this period of eight years was few companies actually who were uh, not the most exponential when we did the study in 2014, but emerged as embracing exponential characteristics over a period of time. Yeah. So what we say is, it's never too late on to embark on an exponential journey. So the most uh, classical example and uh, I share over here is a company called Costco. Uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with it or otherwise I'll invite you to take a look at them. Uh, so when we scored them in 2014, they were not the most exponential organization, but when we did the scoring again in 2021 from the lenses of exponential attributes, uh, we discovered that yes, this company has chosen to embrace and embed those exponential attributes and therefore has been able to outperform others. Yeah, so that was one key lesson learned. The second key lesson learned what we have was uh, the people who got disrupted. Yeah, so if you noticed uh, that we had some uh, technology organizations in the top 10 list, and going back to what Francisco, your other question in terms of, uh, I'm a technology company, can I uh, stamp on you that yes, you'll be perpetually successful? We discovered as a part of the study of looking at large firms, yeah, keep in mind the, uh, the focus away here, this study was large firms, is a lot of them actually were not successful over a period of time. Uh, the two big examples we quote is IBM uh, uh, was 
probably the most valued company uh, in 20s or 10s and g general electric yeah so both of them actually have been struggling to perform and create value for different stakeholders and shareholders uh, so called so i would say being a technology company or being an exponential company is not a uh, so called giving you guarantee uh, and immunity from failure so what we say is one uh, you need to focus and uh, embrace those attributes second thing is you need to ensure that you are innovating on a continuous basis and ensuring that yes those attributes are being sustained in the organization so what happened with these companies uh, so called who sustained and uh, build those uh, attributes so uh, what we witnessed over a period of 2014 to 2022 for these uh, exponential organizations was they outperformed their peer group the bottom 10 companies in terms of revenues by 2 and a half x yeah they outperformed in terms of profitability by almost 7x they outperformed in terms of asset utilization almost 12x and perhaps the biggest most amazing number which we established was they outperforms their non exponential peers in terms of shareholder returns by 40x yeah now Uh, so called when we uh, identified these numbers it took us a moment to digest it uh, so just to give a perspective uh, typical returns for uh, the standard and poors which is benchmark index is 2x or 3x value creation over a period of time these companies delivered 40x returns compared to their non exponential peers yeah so the 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 companies which were scored as non exponentials they actually had negative performance in many instances in terms of total share and low returns whereas all the top 10 exponential organizations they delivered value when it comes to the shareholders part of it yeah so i think this study enabled us to get convinced of ourselves and go back to the business world and convince them that yes hey guys if you're a large organization and you embrace and embed these exponential attributes you are going to be successful yeah and then i we we have evidence now uh, which actually got published from academic perspective as well uh, last year in organization of journal analysis uh, if you want i can share the links to uh, francesco on offline basis and he can share those details with you of these studies but actually even the academia has you now accepted that yes hey guys the exponential framework when uh, when being used by incumbent organization creates value so going back to your question uh, francesco is it only for uh, startups and scale ups no it's relevant for incumbents as well yeah i will quickly talk about the other piece of analysis before i invite questions uh, from you francesco and other yes, uh, there are a couple of questions well. coming up Now, there are a couple of well, well. Let's see if there some questions will come out. I'm sure that something will come. There is yeah. a there are a few comments that are con congratulating on the analysis. So, yeah, sure. So then, let me quickly jump and say, okay, fine. Uh, what 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 we did in the second part. So as I mentioned, uh, I was curious to understand uh, whether this model is successful or not. Uh, so first study, which I did was obviously on the basis of incumbents, which were uh, scored for Fortune. The second element which we looked into was the startup and the scale up. So as a part of the book writing, uh, Salim and company had gone around the world. and identified the uh, 100 odd organizations which they considered to be the most exponentials uh these included a lot of software firms and social media and so on and so forth and as francesco mentioned a lot of times were fairly small organizations at that point of time yeah so the the original uh, valuation was like 100 million to 1 billion for majority of them there were some large organizations as well like microsoft and google and others but predominantly they were small organizations yeah for which valuation was available so again as a part of my curiosity i try to understand what happened to these uh, 100 firms who were rated as top 10 exponential firms in the world now for all of these 100 firms uh, they we, we had business value or uh, valuation available for 57 and then uh, i did a similar analysis and interestingly the first finding which emerged was all of these uh, 57 firms for which valuation was available 80% of them which is close to 50 firms had valuation increase yeah uh, again uh, i'm not too sure how many of you have, might have read as part of your studies or might be familiar with the whole concept of investment but the holy grail of investment typically is chance of 50 50 that 50% you will make money 50% you lose money everybody wants to be in a world of investment where you increase this 51 to or 5050 to 51 to 52 to 53 to as high as possible so what we said was these top 100 firms uh, so called or that uh, 80% had increase in valuation yeah 
So if I had the money to invest, uh, I would have made fortune by investing in the top 100 firms, as simple as that. Yeah. So as the predictive model, what we are saying is, if in an exponential organization that, yes, you are expected to be successful. The second dimension was uh, they just did not make returns. They made staggering returns. A classical example is a company called Duolingo. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's a language education uh, app, uh, global in nature, uh, became small, and then it delivered 162 time returns yeah, over a period of these eight years. Yeah, So that's a classical example. We talk about 2x and 10x. This company delivered 162 times returns to the shareholders. Yeah, But the key thing is over here is it was not an outlier. There are a lot of other companies which have returned 30x and so on and so forth as well. So I think this study enabled us to validate one key hypothesis once again, that yes, being an exponential organization enable you to deliver value for your shareholders. Yeah, Not just for customers and so on and so forth, but for your principal stakeholders, which is a shareholders part yeah so these two studies i would say gave us that conviction that yes if an organization is embracing and embedding those exponential attributes and focusing on scalability and adaptability and being purpose driven you are going to be successful and you're going to be able to deliver shareholder returns on a sustainable basis because we are not talking about one quarter or two quarter or one year we are talking about over a period of eight years these companies have delivered values on an ongoing and sustainable basis yeah. So here I will uh, pause, uh, Francisco, and I'll invite questions and reflections uh, from yourself and the team. Yes, so there is a question that asks uh, if these attributes are also used by companies that are dealing with physical assets and how is the, from the study? I think it was from the top 100 question. So uh, yeah. Tesla is one, so I don't know if you can name... Uh, so sorry, so what is the question? What are other companies which are... The charge? question is uh, of, uh, intangible versus physical assets. Ah, so I would say both for the top 100 as well as the Fortune 100, uh, it's kind of a mix in terms of the industry arena, if I were to call it that way, they are into... A lot of them are technology uh, software companies, uh, but at the same time, a lot of them are hardware companies. So uh, I, I did not talk about, uh, say, uh, there's a manufacturing company called Lockheed Martin, US-based in the Fortune 100, top 10, which are manufacturing what space systems, defense systems, and aircraft, F-16s of the world, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, so they are classical hardcore manufacturing company, but uh, they, they have outperformed their peers. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that's a classic example of a manufacturing company which has embraced and embedded those exponential attributes. And keep in mind, exponential attributes are not just around technologies. Yeah. And again, I'll reiterate, it's not just software. It's not just having technologies. It's having that holistic approach to running a business, being purpose-driven, building a community of your stakeholders, engaging with those stakeholders. So I need to be doing that whether I'm a software company or a hardware company. Yeah, If I'm a hardware company, I'm doing that, then I'm going to be successful. If I'm a software company and I don't embed those exponential attributes, it's not a guarantee, as I mentioned earlier, that it's going to be a recipe for success. Yeah, So we have seen a lot of software companies which have been not successful because they have not embraced and, uh, and embedded those exponential attributes. I hope that answered your question, Francis. I think you did. I think you did. Yes. Let me see if there there are others asking for this. So um, it is I, I'll, outstanding to see the return on investment. Not only, I mean, the Olingo is an, a very special case, I believe. But overall, if you see the numbers, you have thirty times as an average, but probably a median. It, it is. It makes it makes the the conclusion that is outstanding the possible results. Okay. And the data set was 2022, right? Uh, so we, it was a longitudinal study between 2014 to 2022 for both the Fortune 100 yeah, the last, and the, the last top. range. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and obviously we are uh, looking at these companies on an ongoing basis uh, as a part of the research activities, which we keep on doing on a time-to-time -time basis. We have also looked at recently at the Indian uh, 50 firms, uh, Francisco, the largest 50 Indian listed firms. Uh, so the whole idea is we have scored them you now on the exponential uh, attributes. And the whole idea will be a few years down the line, we are going to look into their performance to again validate whether those companies which we scored them high on exponential attributes, did they actually outperform 
platform, they peer groups over a period of time. So the whole idea we are having is to identify exponential organizations across industries and across geographies and see to it that, yes, are they outperforming their peer groups or not? Uh, and then the whole hypothesis we are having is, yes, once you embrace and embed those exponential attributes, you're going to be successful. And I would say, I would say we do witness that on a hands-on basis. So we are not publishing those uh, case studies, but when I and other colleagues uh, work with large or start, startups and scale-ups organizations, we do witness that organizations who would choose to embrace and embed those attributes, uh, they are successful compared to their peer group. So the likes of PNGs and uh, others who have been following the exponential organization framework for a period of time, what we know of for a fact is that yes, they are out, they are outperforming their own performance over a period of time, and they're also outperforming their peer groups. Very good. Thank you. Um, the, the PNG case, they have it as a case, uh, my article to study, but it's going to be in a couple of weeks still. So it's it's still there, but they haven't discovered it yet. Mm. Uh, guys, any other question here? Please let us know if there is somebody. Okay. Um, I think you can. we can move to the last part, probably. Mm, sure. So I think uh, the way I would uh, uh, step back and sh talk in terms of what uh, we have done in the last one hour, 15 minutes, short Francisco, I attempted to share uh, what Exponential Organizations Framework is all about. I talked about in the last uh, half an hour in terms of why it's relevant and why organizations uh, should be pursuing it. And I would say why it's relevant for you as students uh, who are studying right now, what it takes to become successful, whether you become part of a large organization as you start in your corporate careers or you uh, become entrepreneurs and, and you embark on an entrepreneurship journey, I uh, hope and uh, I, I uh, wish you successes. And I think uh, what we are saying is, uh, exponential organization framework and business model innovation and invention is going to be the bedrock for success. Yeah? So the why and the what is something we have talked about in the last uh, 75 odd minutes. What I'd like to do very quickly in the next uh, five to 10 odd minutes before again, reopening for any questions and answers, uh, Francesco would be briefly talked in terms of the how. Yeah. Uh, so obviously what we say is yes, is uh, critical for you to become an exponential organization. We say yes, is proven why it's worth doing it, whether you're a startup or a scale up or you're a large organization. What we say is at least from a financial shareholder value perspective, it, it is proven now that yes, you are creating value. Now, what I would like to share is how do you become an exponential organization, whether you're a startup or a scale up or an incumbent, is uh, what, again, I would say is this my approach as an individual consultant or as a consulting firm. What we say is there are three key cornerstones for an organization to become successful and embrace and embed those exponential attributes is First one is to define your organization MTP, Massive Transformative Purpose, and your transformation and the growth agenda. Yeah, so that's a key uh, beginning point itself of defining why do you exist and again I will reiterate uh, and again we have talked about only a 30,000 feet language today is you need to be having a purpose and you need to be having a massive transformative purpose yeah and you need to be defining your growth and transformation agenda with respect to these exponential attributes so that's one key way to become successful the second element what I call is to build future ready capabilities and culture yeah Again, it's around the skill set and as much as the mindset for organizations to become successful. Yeah, By having uh, only the skills, and when I say the skills, it could be the physical skills or the people skills. Yeah, It could be in terms of having the technology or it could be having the people who are having exponential capabilities. But unless and until I have the culture in the organization, which is enabling me to experiment, unless until having the autonomy, as we talked about it, unless until having the mindset of abundance and culture of agility and innovation, you're not going to be successful in the mid to long term. Yeah, So I would say that's a key enabler to success to say, okay, yes, I'm building those future ready capabilities, both in terms of uh, the skill set and the mindset and the culture. Last but not the least is uh, of the element of how, again, I would say this is more relevant when you become an entrepreneur or you become a business leader in a combined organization, how consultants like I and Francisco enable organizations to become successful is we have a complete transformation methodology, which is called the exponential sprint. Uh, so both with startups and scale-ups and as well as with the incumbent organizations, 
we work with the business leaders and the project teams to run is what we call is a 10 week sprint uh, we have different models we done it over a week cycle also and a longer period of time but the whole idea is to go through the cycle of dreaming big identifying disruption opportunities bringing to the market and delivering them on an ongoing basis yeah and embedding those exponential attributes on a, a, on different parts of the business on an ongoing basis yeah so these are the three key elements I would say we uh, work with businesses again whether you're a startup or a scale up or a large incumbent organization to see to it that yes you are embracing and embedding those exponential attributes of uh, MTP and the scale and the ideas in different parts of your businesses and on the overall business as a whole on an ongoing basis now. Uh, at this stage, I would like to do a second poll uh, very quickly. Uh, once again, I would like to go and scan the QR code and uh, or use uh, this uh, code, which is here. I will stop uh, sharing and activate that poll. Uh, hope uh, everybody got a chance to quickly scan. Otherwise, you just go to the same one and I've activated it. So the question which you're going to be asked is, so what? Uh, what is the impact potential of being an exponential organization? Yeah, so that's a key question I'm uh, trying to seek answers to. And it's an open text uh, question. I would uh, invite you to just type in what comes to your mind. Uh, so in the last 75 minutes, you have heard of the business model innovation of exponential organization. My question to you colleagues would be, what would you think is a benefit of doing all this? Yeah, it's an open text question. Yeah, okay. So, so these are five responses. I'm probably e either others have chosen not to respond or uh, they're they, they still not uh, clear. But I would say, yes, some of these elements which have been talked about uh, new disruption, growth, scalability, innovation, profits, uh, uh, the, the, the enhanced efficiency. I think some of the responses are cut off. Management. I can't understand this uh, word, uh, probably, and maybe a type of error by somebody. Uh, so I think, yes, these are some of the benefits which we experience companies look for and or they achieve by embracing and embedding the whole uh, exponential organizations uh, model. And that's where I think uh, the whole purpose of today's uh, session was to um, uh, kind of uh, share with you, uh, students and colleagues, uh, what uh, are different ways of looking at uh, running a business uh, in the future uh, based on what we have experienced and learned from successful organizations towards thriving and thriving in the future. I'll just uh, quickly go back to the slides just to navigate once again uh, is what we see and what I've experienced over the last uh, several years of working and enabling organizations on different transformation uh, efforts is uh, three key elements of benefits. Uh, first, I would say is in terms of building sustainable advantages and revenue streams and more so becoming platforms and building up ecosystems. That's one key uh, impact uh, and the value which our companies witness. The second element is again in terms of uh, the transformation and enhanced business performance. So I talked about the exploit and the explore. So I would say leveraging what you're having right now in the business is a key benefit which companies achieve. And again, in terms of the alignment and the engagement with different stakeholders, whether it's investors or customers or suppliers or employees. The third one is, I would say the core, honestly speaking for myself, uh, who believes in sustainability comes from people. Yeah. Uh, what we've witnessed in working with different organizations is uh, it takes care of what I and Francisco and Salim call it the immune system, where typical tendency of an organization when you talk about change is, no, that's a bad and dirty word. What we say is uh, when you approach it from an exponential transformation perspective, the openness to embrace change becomes far bigger. Yeah, uh, People enjoy it because they believe in being future ready. Who doesn't want to be future ready? Uh, from an individual perspective, what we say is your organization is the bottleneck. And therefore, you're able to build future ready capabilities. You're able to attract and retain talent. And I would say the companies we have worked for, whether they are, again, startups or scale-ups or incumbents, is people enjoy it. I think that's the core of what we have witnessed is people enjoy uh, going through these experiences. So what we say is, in a nutshell, companies who again uh, embrace and embed uh, those exponential attributes and go through the journey of embracing these attributes, what we witness is uh, 10x value and impact creation yeah, for each one of them. Yeah. 
Uh, so I think that's the invitation for each one of you, even though you're a student, I love Francesco's approach to introducing this whole concept of exponential organization at this very stage when you're learning about the business world and you're yet to kind of step into the business world in reality. So again, I would say whether you are a potential entrepreneur or you want to become part of the corporate world, hopefully this uh, session and the next few weeks and months of your learning journey uh, you will probably use this as a bedrock and as a foundation to think that, yes, how can I become a successful entrepreneur? How can I become a successful business leader? How can I create a successful venture and how can I have a successful firm? The way to do that, I would say, is again, just to uh, recap, focus on your business model and uh, continuous innovation of business model in terms of the DVF, uh, front end, back end, and the uh, desirability, viability, and feasibility. Focus on embracing and embedding this exponential attribute and keep in mind that, yes, if you do it, you're going to be successful and you're going to be able to create that 10x impact and value for your business, the shareholders and the stakeholders at large. Yeah. So on this note, I will uh, bring uh, an end to my uh, so-called sharing of my perspectives and experiences and uh, any last minute questions, uh, happy to take them. You're invaluable. Thank you very much for this. Uh, has been a great deep dive. Um, it's really has been very very enlightening. I really appreciate your presence here, and I think for all uh, I speak for the class now, it's been a great experience. I have um, a question. I must end up with a question. I know that um, what you presented is your daily practice. And so when you practice something, values must come from inside. So it is something that it comes from the from your insight. So um, we spoke about purpose and and values. And I must ask you, what is your purpose? Where, where does this uh, energy come from to treat the subject on this perspective? This is not it's in a way, it's also a spiritual perspective to, 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 to innovation. So it's not just a, it's not just just mechanicism. No, 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 no. Where does this come from? So, so I did show that in the introduction slide, but I did not refer to my purpose because, yes, uh, it would not have made much sense. Uh, but, uh, yes, as a human being and as a corporate professional, as a consultant and a coach and a business leader, uh, pretty much, I would say, uh, have been driven by my uh, massive transformative purpose, Francesco, of uh, inspiring and enabling uh, business leaders and humanity at large to expand and unlock their potential. So I think that has been the cornerstone of my existence. I always believe in the epitaph as a key thing. Uh, so I would say, whether I die today or tomorrow, what do I want to be remembered as, uh, so-called, in a good way or a bad way or a clear way? Uh, but I would say, yes, that's the legacy I would leave to leave, is to inspire as many people and in the business or in the non-business world as much as possible to expand and unlock their potential. All right. Wow. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chandra. I want to share with you a few messages that are coming in uh, from uh, appreciation of, the, of your class. Uh, amazing analysis, extremely interesting, very interesting today. Uh, great to learn something new and very useful. I think, uh, I think uh, you made a great uh, hit to this class today. Uh, pleasure and hopefully it was uh, worthwhile one and a half hours 90 minutes of investment of uh, time Very from good. everyone i'll share the presentation deck uh, with you francisco and feel free to share that with the participants and the Please, students. we so will yes for sure I will, I will, it will be part of our class it will be part of our class um i think if there are any other last question or comment we can take it for now otherwise we can uh let chander go i know that in zurich this is way past lunchtime so I'm not a lunch person, but I'm conscious I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of lunch for the students. Uh, but yeah, but feel free. Oh, I right. hope it was genuinely useful. Uh, but yeah, look forward to uh, staying connected and wishing you all a wonderful learning journey and the corporate journey in the future. Wish you all the best. Hi, Francesco. Sorry to interrupt. I want to just interrupt you to say thank you, Chanda, for, for the very wonderful analysis. I'm a very, very bad bandwidth here in Sardinia, so it's very complicated for me to... I got all the information I will digest uh, reading the all the all the slides that you have presented that I copied with the, the screenshot because they are very, very interesting. 
and uh, just always thinking when you talk about these things to real real uh, 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 analysis about uh, companies so adapting what you are saying to my my personal experience and the business that I've done in the past and doing it uh, presently um but anyway as I said, I have to digest all the things I've read and make a map, uh, map mind of about the EXO, uh, the financial organization, because I think better to visualize all the information that uh, put, I've already done before this this, 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 um, this meeting, just be, to understand better the things. But sure, anyway. Sure. For sure, sure. And, and, and as I will say, it's not just the first one. I'm sure Francesco will be taking me through different elements uh, in the future. Feel free to reach out to either one of us if you uh, you thought this was too much uh, too soon or too much too fast. But the whole <laughs> no, idea is yes I'm to sad. just um, um, put in the seats. We have to digest it, of course. <laughs> it's the This is nice. Very very nice. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Okay, very good. Thank you, Fulio, for your comments. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you, Chandra, once again. I guess Pleasure, we'll Francesco, once again. Yep, look forward to that. And good luck to everyone in your journeys. Wishing you all bye -bye. the best. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.